Buenas tardes a todos. Good evening. I'm Abelardo de la Peña Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes in downtown Los Angeles, welcoming you to En Casa con la Plaza. It's our virtual program we, we've been doing since, since April of 2020 due to the pandemic and the closing of all museums. And oh, wait, here we go. First, first glitch. Anyway, thank you so much for, for joining us. We've been bringing you the best of our community's history, art, and culture from our home to yours via these presentations, conversations, demonstrations, and performances. Our sponsors tonight, PepsiCo and Kaiser Permanente. If you're joining us on Zoom, please use the chat feature and the Q&A feature. We'll be taking questions and answering them later, but let us know where you're viewing from, where you're tuning in, Zooming in from. All of you on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us tonight as well. Use the comment feature there to uh, let us know where you're viewing from, ask questions, make comments, do shout outs. This is an interactive exercise here in which uh, we communicate to you and you communicate to us. And uh, to start the communication going, let's bring on the man of the happy hour, Dan Guerrero. Dan, come on, zoom on in. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well, Dan. How are you doing tonight? I, I'm fine, but I'm trying to fix my chair. Otherwise, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm very excited. Look, I'm excited with, with all our guests, and that's the truth. But Luis Valdez, I'm really excited. He is, uh, you know, everyone knows what a great artist he is, but he is a genuine genius. He really is. I, I've seen him speak so many times. And sometimes off the cuff, you know, and, and, and it comes out like poetry. I'm like, it would take a regular human a week of editing and changing and cutting and paste. And he's, yeah, so I, I'm very excited about tonight. Very, very special gentleman. And we're excited out here as well. I'm excited. Uh, we could tell by your suit. You're, I mean, oh, your shirt look at that, that you're excited as well. I was, I'm excited I can still fit into it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might have to cut the back or something, but it's fine. It's the pandemic, no meals out, you know, so it's fine. Soon, soon. So anyway, I'm going to uh, let you go and I'm going to introduce our very special guest and we'll see you during the Q&A. We'll see you soon. Dan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where you all are, but I'm glad you're with us. It would actually take three happy hours to get the full story on tonight's guest, and even that might not be enough. Playwright, director, filmmaker, activist, a pioneer of the Chicano movement, founder of El Teatro Campesino, the classic film La Bamba, and the landmark play Zoot Suit. But it's the man himself that we're gonna to meet tonight through lesser known stories of his journey. Some of them may really surprise you, did you know that he was a child ventriloquist? Yeah, I thought not. Okay, so let's hear them all and zoom in Luis Miguel Valdez. Hey there. Hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine, Dan. How are you? I'm wonderful. You're Great zooming you. in from San Juan Bautista. Absolutely. What a beautiful place that is. You know, it took me so long to get there. I couldn't believe I'd never been there, but I finally did. And it's, mm. it's a magical little jewel. No wonder you like living there. Well, I think anyone all over the world has seen the movie Vertigo, you know, the Hitchcock's film. Uh, this is the town with that mission in it. You know, this is our hometown. And so uh, Hitchcock was here in the 50s filming uh, Vertigo with Kim Novak and Jimmy Stewart. Sure. We still remember it fondly around here. You know, our coffee shop, it's called Vertigo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. I forgot all about that movie. That's right. That's right. We're, we're going to have some great stories and I'm really excited. So, so I toast you and, and thank you for being with me tonight. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank and, you very much. And um, ah, you have your beverage of choice. Yeah, my Heart Mountain uh, cup. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we got this in Wyoming. So... I've never been to Wyoming. I got to get there in Montana. I'll do it all. Um, yeah. I want to start with because I, I'm so honored because somos primos. I mean, we are we are cousins. We most definitely are. 
Yeah, so I thought I I, I would like to know because I, I do know slightly, but um, actually I believe the connect is my my nana, my dad's mother, Concepcion. Your grandmother, your grandmother and my grandmother were sisters. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> That's close. I have a picture of my nana, by the way. Concept, look. <laughs> now, if that is not the quintessential nana, trenza, guitar, and all. He was they a were, musician in the family. <laughs> yes. Well, she was the one that taught dad the guitar. That was his only music teacher ever. Well, you know, they were sisters. Yeah. Well, we're close. Yeah, we're damn close, man. It was uh, your dad, Lalo, and my dad, Pancho, were first cousins. Wow. In Am Tucson. I in your will? <laughs> Are we in, that close? In, in Tucson, in uh, Calle Mayor, you know, Mayor Street. Sure, they, sure. They all lived on Mayor Street there. And... Uh, in the 1920s, and uh, my mother lived there too. So we're related on my dad's side, but oh my but uh, my mother lived there on Mayor Street as well. You know, as a kid. So, yeah, it's it's part of the history of uh, of immigration in this country. You know, uh, Tucson was a big uh, landing place for a lot of people, especially people from Sonora. You know, it was very natural. Right. They've been they've been coming to Tucson before it was part of the United States. So. It was the nearest city around, right? If you came from northern Mexico, you ended up in Tucson, you know. And and Father Kino, of course, had uh, established San Javier del Bac there, right, in the the early uh, 17th century. So it was uh, part of the Jesuit, you know, uh, colonization of uh, of all those Yaqui lands in Sonora. Wow. So, well, well, my dad was born in Tucson in 1916. So my my I think my nana thought that came up uh, during the Mexican Revolution, but they were invited up because my 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 grandfather was a an expert boiler maker and the yeah. Southern Pacific Railroad brought them up to Tucson. That's how they got there. So it had to be during the revolution if dad was born in 1916. Yeah, my dad was born in 1912. And uh, my grandmother and uh, and my uh, grandmother uh, met and married in 1910 in, New in, in Nogales. My dad oh. was born in Nogales four days after it became part of uh, Arizona, after the United, uh, became part of the United States. Because wow. the now there's Nogales, Mexico, and Nogales, Arizona. It's, yeah, it's so in that my dad was a dual citizen because of that, because he was born right on the border, right? There was no distinction between Nogales, Mexico, and, and Nogales, Sonora, and Nogales, Arizona in those days. So... Um, yeah, we finally took, uh, my wife and I finally took my mom and dad back to Tucson and, and back to Nogales uh, in the 80s, you know. They hadn't been back since the 20s. Wow. So, we have yeah. a photo that we had a sneak preview of. Those, that's your parents. That's Francisco, <coughs> excuse me, and Armeda. They look like movie stars. They're beautiful. <laughs> They're well, my beautiful. mother was quite attractive as a young woman. She, she uh, well, she was only in her 20s there. She was 26. And uh, she she had uh, four kids already. My older brother that that shot was taken on the Santa Cruz boardwalk at, oh. at the end of the summer, of 1946. We'd been picking prunes, so my dad rewarded us by taking us to the beach. It was the first time that I'd seen the Pacific Ocean. And uh, my older brother Frank uh, was out. He was nine years old by then. He was out there on the boardwalk, you know, with the game. So he didn't get to take the picture. But uh, that's the whole family, the, my whole family at the time. Well, uh, you, you were the second of 10 children, right? Right, right. And uh, and so and my older brother passed away a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm kind of the older guy now. I'm the oldest guy. Yeah, wow. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it, it happens. You know, one day you're the cute little kid running around and next you're the village elder. <laughs> It yes, <laughs> it's exactly. the truth. I'm like, holy moly. Um, yeah. yeah, the original cast is all gone. Now, now it's us, you know. Yeah, I really appreciate the uh that actually that experience that my dad took us to see the ocean, you know. And um I, I learned uh, uh, an important lesson there because he, he bought us balloons. He bought me and my sister balloons, helium balloons, right? And, and it was nothing more marvelous for me than uh, a helium balloon because it floated on itself. So while he got us the balloon, my mom went out and got us some hot dogs. And so then I've got the balloon and I'm looking at it marbled, you know, and then my mother shows up with a hot dog and I, I went for it. I said, oh, you know, oh. and I grabbed the hot dog and then, and then I thought for a moment, where's my balloon? And then I look, <laughs> there goes my balloon, you know? So when I tell that story to students, I say, uh, the, the moral of the story is if you're real careful, 
you can hold on to your dreams and eat them too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's fantastic. That's a scene from a movie, right? Yeah. Well, that happened that same day we took that picture. <laughs> wow. So. What a beautiful memory. Your, your, your parents were both uh, uh, farm workers, yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, my grandfather, uh, my dad's dad, was also in the railroad. He, he used to work um, uh, uh, from Tucson all the way to uh, Hadley Junction, I think it's called, in, in Tucson by Mammoth. And um, he used to drive the engine into the roundhouse. And uh, it, it's documented in his World War I draft of application. He was already in his 30s, but all the men had to sign uh, these draft applications, sign them and, and fill them out. So it indicated that he worked at the roundhouse. And so it was family legend in my family that he could drive the engine, you know, in and out of the, um, of the roundhouse and that he worked as a mechanic. Now, my grandfather, Santiago, that's my dad's uh, father, died at the age of uh, 38. So he was real young. Wow. Wow. And... Uh, and uh, I don't know what his capacities were, but if he could drive an engine, a railroad uh, engine, he must have had some mechanical abilities, you know, that we lost tragically because it left my dad an orphan at 12. He was the oldest and my grandmother with four other kids. And so they became farm workers. I mean, there was no other way around it, right? And um, so, uh, you know, these are just uh, the tragedies of everyday life, particularly in those days, life was hard. But it's interesting that on your side of the family, they worked on the railroad and on my side of the family, they worked on the railroad. Mm -hmm. That was one of the uh, upscale jobs in Tucson at the time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And my grandfather worked there till he retired and, and they lived in Tucson the rest of their lives. Wow, well, bless now, him. Now, you, you were, you were uh, uh, I have a picture of you as a kid. You were already working in the fields yourself by this age, practically. Yeah, yeah, that's me at six. You know, that's when I got hooked in the theater, uh, on the theater. It, uh, my first great experience was in a place called Corcoran, you know. Actually, it's a little school called Stratford outside of Corcoran. We were migrant workers picking cotton, and uh, the teacher took my lunch bag. And uh, I, I've been saving it every day to take it back to my mom. And uh, so I thought it was missing, and I started to panic because the bus was leaving. And then she saw me panicking and asked her for my bag, and she says, I can't give it to you. So she escorted me into this little back room and there I saw my bag all ripped up, floating in a basin of water. And I learned one of the secrets of, paper, of uh, the universe at that time, it was called paper mache. <laughs> you know, she was, she was taking these pieces of paper and putting them oh. on, a, on, a, on a rubber, on a plastic mold, a clay mold. It was a oh. monkey. And I, I, it was already November, so I knew it couldn't be for Halloween. So what, what's this for? And he says, for a play. We're gonna have auditions uh, next Monday. And so I got uh, auditioned and got my first role in the theater. I was, it was, uh, the whole school was involved. It's called Christmas in the Jungle. They needed two first graders to play monkeys. And so he, the teacher made a mask out of paper mache, uh, a monkey mask, which was, and I got a costume that was better than my own clothes. But the thing is that uh, the week of the show, uh, I came home back to the ranch, back to the labor camp where we were living. And my mother said, we're leaving tomorrow. And I said, but it was like a Tuesday. And, and I said, but mom, the, the show's on Friday. And she says, no, yes, you know, we have no choice that we're being evicted. And so uh, we were farm workers, the season was over and we were elected, evicted from the labor camp. And I'll never forget driving to that little town of Stratford in the fog. And I felt this hole open in my, open in my chest. And I mean, I could have been broken, but I've always believed that a negative can be turned into a positive. So I took with me the secret of paper mache. I could make my own masks. And uh, the love, unrequited love of the theater, the desire to be on stage that had been unsatisfied and also residual anger because we had been evicted from a labor camp. So approximately 20 years later, I went to Cesar Chavez and pitched him an idea for a theater of by and for farm workers. I know. Oh, my God. But, you know, that that's the that story you're telling is happening today to farm worker children. You know, I, I, I was thinking about you uh, uh, as, as this child and going harvest to harvest and never you must have gone to I don't know how many schools. So how do you make friends? Uh, is it the same farm worker children that travel along? How what kind of life is that? Well, we know what kind of life is it. And it's very vivid to you still. You remember it well. Very vivid. Uh, fortunately, we traveled as family groups, right? So I got to see a lot of my cousins. And so we traveled. 
And uh, so once I learned the secret of paper mache, I would I would organize playtime, you know, with my cousins. And it was always about putting on a play, you know, under the trees or in a barn or, or whatever. Sure. And uh, we'd make masks. I'd get them to make newspaper and make masks until they got tired. You know, they 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 got bored. <laughs> they didn't want to do theater anymore. So I started making puppets. You know, the puppets never got tired. <laughs> wow. So. Oh, my God. That's how the puppetry and this photo is a treasure. This was you with your puppets. Look at that. Yeah, that's me in high school, my freshman year in high school. Uh, that's my friend, my best friend at the time. He's passed away since then. I taught him how to do ventriloquism. I was self-taught ventriloquist. And I, on my knee there, you see two dummies. The, the, the little guy there with a the mustache looking toward us is, that's a Jerry Mahoney dummy, which I fixed up. And uh, <laughs> I call him Ellie Nelson. And then that's Marcelino Pipin on my left knee there, my Mexican dummy. And uh, so I could do bilingual acts. Wow. And uh, and uh, they became a uh, little Ali Nelson became my Anglo alter ego, you know, but he was cool. You know, he was he had a little mustache and he wasn't a racist. You know, he was he was my friend and uh, because he was me. And then Marcelino was was my Mexican side. So uh, so that was high school. It, it made me freshman class president in my my act, you know, and, and then in 1956, I was invited onto uh, a half hour program in San Jose, live KNTV, live theater, uh, live television, black and white. And I became a regular for 18 weeks, uh, five minutes every Sunday where I could do my my dummies, you know. And uh, <sighs> so I was on uh, I was on on television in, in the 50s, right, 1956. And that and I had an art director. And, and so that oriented me toward the profession. I said. Uh, I want to do this. I want to be in show business. But it's so interesting because as our conversation continues, I could see your journey, you know, starting because one thing led to this, led to that in terms of uh, the theatrical that eventually becomes a teatro campesino. The, the whole journey is so clear. That is absolutely fascinating. Uh, wow. I love that story. Um, you finally, you, you went to high school. You. <clears throat> as you just say, and then you got a scholarship and went to San Jose State, and there you were in the drama department, but the scholarship was for math and physics. Yeah. Math and physics, yeah. Yeah, but you I, were... I, I, I love ahead. mathematics, you know, I love math, I love science. Uh, I had, my older brother actually uh, was an engineer. I mean, he graduated uh, uh, with his degree in, in math and physics, you know, and he went to work in uh, Silicon Valley, he went to work, uh, in Los Angeles as well, Lytton Industries. He was, uh, he, he worked at Vandenberg actually launching missiles, you know, uh, wow. for the government. Um, we used to dream about going to the moon <laughs> back in the 50s. Our, our dream was to, to become spacemen, become astronauts before there was a space program. Uh, but in any case, um, he had that, he had that fascination and I love math and I love physics. I love science, but I had this other secret love, which was theater yeah. and this unrequited love of the theater that I had to do. Right. So uh, I did a very impractical thing, which was I switched majors my second year at San Jose State. I won a scholarship on my strength in the sciences. This was the year after Sputnik 1958. When uh -huh. I started, the country was turning toward the sciences. You know, they were encouraging all the students to become engineers. So I went with it and, and I enjoyed it. I saw the birth of Silicon Valley, you know, uh, uh, Varian Associates, I was out there, you know, with uh, visiting these new companies that were evolving, but uh, I couldn't suppress my love and fascination for the theater. And so I, I figured uh, I, I'd cast my fortune to the winds, you know, and see what would happen. It was not a practical thing for the a migrant farm worker to do is to give up the security of the sciences, particularly when I was good at it. I was a straight A student. I only say that because I don't look like a straight A uh, math major, you know. But I think I, you I, do. <laughs> what <laughs> What I, did your parents think of this when you suddenly, because of course you had your first play produced at San Jose State, uh, the drama department. What did they think of your uh, being in the arts as opposed to being something like a real person well you know my, my parents were always very proud they had always insisted that we do our score you know go to school it it, it but again the, the older kids you know we sure. got a lot of push but the 
the thing is that they had, they had only gone so far. My dad actually should have been a history professor because he was like an autodictat in that sense. He was always reading history books. So he should have been a history professor. My mom uh, was a spiritual counselor. She taught herself to type and, and she had a whole, she was a, a psychological, uh, she should have been a psychiatrist, my mom. But anyway, uh, they, they never got past uh, the limitation. Eighth grade, my dad went to the fifth grade, then he had to get out and work. Sure. But they pushed that love of education to their kids. And so uh, when we, uh, my brother and I started to go to college, uh, they were overjoyed. I mean, they, they couldn't read beyond a certain point as to what our destiny was to be. They didn't know what nuclear physics was, right? I mean, they knew it was science. Uh, but uh, it, my mom was equally uh, happy that I was going to be an English teacher as much as, as a math professor. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Is uh, On the one hand, I could have told my mom, mom, I'm going to be a nuclear physicist. She would say, que bien, mijito, you know? Or I could have said, mom, I'm going to be a playwright, que bien, mijito. You know, it was all, it was all the same. Yeah. They did live, of course, to see my success as a playwright and as a filmmaker. So I, I verified their dreams in me, you know, as far as that's concerned. Uh, oh. but, and, and, and my brother also saw, I mean, even though he had a very healthy career as an engineer in Silicon Valley, um, uh, he also know he, he had a, a, a show business bug too, that he never developed. He couldn't develop it because he was in the sciences. In any case, um, uh, it, it, it became, uh, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that when you set out to do something and you set your goals. And, and I never doubted that it, somehow that I was choosing the right path that I was going to be a playwright because I saw the need for it. You know, I saw that we weren't being portrayed anywhere, you know, and in America, I was an English major. I got to study all of American literature and English literature, world literature. And I said, where's our face? Where are we? We're not here. And we need to put ourselves here. So I chose drama as a way to do that very directly. My first play, The Shrunken Head of Pancho Villa, full-length play, was produced at San Jose State. I directed it. I didn't intend to direct it, but my playwriting professor says, you know, there's no one else that can do this. You have to do this. And I said, but I, I didn't train to be a director. And he says, you're the playwright. You know what you need. You know what you want. He says, so, so I became my own director right from the start, writer, director. And uh, fortunately, in 1964, uh, there was a Northwest Drama Conference at the turn of the year there at San Jose State, and two American playwrights, uh, uh, William Soroyan, he was famous, wow. and, wow. Uh, and uh, John Howard Lawson, the founder of the Hollywood uh, Screenwriters Guild, uh, and also a Broadway playwright, both saw my play, and as, as really, it, in almost a formal kind of way, they welcomed me into the American theater. They, they told the audience, this is the first Mexican-American play. It's been a long time in coming. And they welcomed me. And yeah. so it was like a blessing, you know, from two mentors. They were both members of the group theater, which I, I always admired from the 1930s. And so it was uh, a baptism, the right kind of baptism for me, an artistic baptism. And were the right padrinos. And they were the, they were the padrinos, man. They were my padrinos, wow. you know. Uh, yeah. uh, Howard, uh, John Howard Lawson was a Jewish background. He was a Brooklyn kid. And of course, Soroyan, William Soroyan was an Armenian from Fresno. And so, you know, I, I, I got it from both sides in a sense. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was wonderful. It yeah. was magical. It well, was... you know, so again, it, I, we come out of necessity. You know, in some ways, we're all born out of a kind of necessity that most of us aren't even aware of what our roles are supposed to be. And... Uh, and I had a role to, to play to fulfill this gap, you know, this vacuum that existed with relation to our people. You know, the Chicanos were just not getting the kind of playtime, you know, screen time that we needed. And so uh, somebody had to break the ice, you know. And I've always said that uh, we broke the ice uh, with Zoot Suit on Broadway. Unfortunately, we had to break it with our heads. <laughs> They, they, you know, they, they still, New York still, you know, to them, Latino is Puerto Rican, uh, 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 Dominicano is the Caribbean, maybe Colombiano. They still really don't know anything about us, which is not only 
upsetting, but the, they don't want, to, they don't care to. Now, that's the part I get. I don't get. You know, you do, I mean, people go to the theater to be educated, to learn, to find out about things they didn't know. But there's still that hole. I, I, I don't know what that's about. But we'll solve it, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> When you I, I, you wrote and directed uh, the Pancho Villa play and you you cast it as well because there was an actress in it who was flawless. I hear we have a photo of this lovely woman who looks very feisty. Look at her. She is not kidding. Now, who is that lady? That is Lupe Trujillo. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> La Lupe, we love her. You know, she's nearly as celebrated as you are, Luis. Not to take away from you, but everybody loves Lupe. You know they do. That's my wife uh, and loving partner for the last 51 years, you know, Lupe Trujillo Valdez. The, the shot of her playing the character Lupe uh, in The Shrunken Head was our Teatro Camesino production back in 1968. Oh, oh, it wasn't San Jose. Well, how did oh. you two meet? That's how I thought you met. Well, do you want to tell Luke? Let, I'll let uh, Luca tell the story. Go ahead. How did we meet? Actually, we met during the March to Sacramento. Uh, I was a student at the uh, College of Sequoias in Visalia, and uh, I lived in Cutler at the time. My parents were farm workers. So uh, um, it was, they had uh, they were stopping by during the march in Cutler, and my mother had been there in the afternoon uh, when they were setting up for the march um, for the marchers to come in for the evening. And my mother told me, "Ay, mi hijita, había un nombre tan hablaba con unas palabras tan bonito." You know, she was talking about Luis that uh, because there was a confrontation between Luis and one of the growers uh, who was Latino. Mexicano, but uh, was uh, thinking that Luis was illiterate and didn't understand English. And so he spoke back to him in English. And so, of course, my mother would witness that. Uh, so that evening I went to see the performance. Uh, the fact that was the first time I'd ever seen live theater in my life. I, I, and it was amazing. And so I, I felt like, um, you know, it was like this uh, epiphany that somehow this was going to change my life forever. And it was like joining the circus. The next night I went to uh, Sanger where they performed. And uh, so uh, I didn't meet them again until uh, when I transferred from, from COS to Fresno State. And Luis was teaching a class there. And I joined the Teatro Campesino at that time. And the rest is history. <laughs> it is history. And you know, that that's the exact word when you introduce as your partner, because it's so obvious to anyone that sees the two of you, you are partners, you just are, you know, uh, and it's, it's such a beautiful thing to watch. And you have three beautiful sons. Yes. All yes. in the theater as well. Did you, did you, when you, when you met Luis, because he still has fire and passion, I can't even imagine when he was young, he must have just been... <laughs> He must have just been on fire. I mean, what? I mean, I guess I'm trying to say, did you say this is not your regular dude here? This is something special. I mean, did you get that sense? Well, you know, I always say that I fell in love with his politics before <laughs> I fell in love with the man. I, I knew instinctively that he had something to say to a much larger audience than just that march and i felt that he was able to articulate everything i felt uh that this was a struggle it was a political struggle and i think as a, a political activist that's when i became active uh i discovered who i was and and um you know it's been it, it has been a partnership you know like all marriages uh highs and lows that we've gone through but throughout through all of that i think when it maintain our is the love that we have for respect for each other. Uh, I still see him as I saw him standing on that flatbed truck. Um, no matter how old we get and how I'm losing hair and white hair and whatever, he's still, he's still that dynamic man that I married. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we all have our flaws, you know, uh, but everything is forgivable. Yeah, I think uh -huh. something something has to be said about it in terms of family with Lupe. Um, her family also arrived in uh, in California in the 1920s, and uh, but they were in Santa Paula. You know, they were uh -huh. uh, in in um, 
well, they were in labor camps, basically in the Santa Paula area. And there was a big lemon strike in 1941 and her parents uh, were very much involved. There were strikers and they lost it. And eventually all of the strikers had to leave because they could no longer find work there. So my uh, father-in-law, Lorenzo Trujillo, and his, my mother-in-law, Victoriana, took their family and went north up into the, um, the San Joaquin Valley to Cutler. So he was always like a, a union man. You know, he was a very supporter, a supporter of Cesar Chavez. And, uh, and they passed this uh, passion and, and social conscience onto their daughters, you know, and, and their sons. The thing is that uh, if people know the San Joaquin Valley, they know, they know how big Tulare County is. It's huge, you know. It used to be Tulare Lake. It's right in the middle. So Lupe was in the northernmost part of Tulare County in Cutler, way up there almost in the mountains. And my family lived uh, in Delano and early Mart down at the Southern part of Tulare County. So uh, we were, uh, she's the girl next door, you know, <laughs> we're from the same county. Literally. And, uh, somehow destiny, I mean, even though my family moved out of the, the San Joaquin Valley, we moved to the Bay Area. Uh, when I came back to work with Cesar Chavez, uh, I, I met the girl next door, you know, it was, it was very natural. <laughs> And you married in 1969. We have a beautiful photo. Is this a wedding photo? Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. And, and that's that's her headdress. It's a, we we're already courting uh, Aztec Mayan uh, values here, and so <laughs> I, I made that. I made that uh, out of celastic, and it's uh, it's Spanish combs, and it's celastic, and it's ostrich feathers, white feathers. Uh, that uh, I wanted her to look like a. The Aztec beauty she was, you know, so. <laughs> and is, and is. <laughs> exactly. It's, you know, I, we've been together many times, and I, I'm thinking, uh, remember the event I did at the Kennedy Center to honor Caesar, and, and yes. you were both, of course, there. And even during rehearsals, and you, you just, you're like swimming in the same stream, and always very calm, and uh, Lupa seems a very calming influence, but you too, you, you, you're very even keeled, I guess, but it's, I, I always enjoy watching you both. It, it's almost mythical. It, it really is. I, I, I'm, I'm so happy you came on. So uh, we're going to, we're going to chit chat better. Miha, come back at the I end did. because okay. I want people to ask Lupe questions as well. She's has a fascinating, and you can get some real cheese may on, you know who. So we'll see you in a little <laughs> bit. Okay. Lupe okay. has been directly responsible for the peace and quiet of our lives. Okay. Oh, I'm sure. That, 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 I'm that's sure. so much the secret of, of longevity in terms of marriages. Yeah, you know, the home should be a place where peace resides, not, right. not war. And so uh, I, I, we agreed early on that we would not, we would not fight. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to resolve our issues. We, yeah, we, we, we've had our spats, but, but we get over them real quick, you know, because why, why carry on? It, it's, it's not good for health and, and it's not good for life and it's not good for the children, finally, right? So Listen, uh, as we go out the door every day and, and we get beat up by life and work and all that stuff, when you go to your home, that should be where you get to heal and get refuge, ready for the exactly. next battle. Exactly. That, that's what it should be, you know? And so it's a tribute to Lupa's humanity. She's been able to tolerate uh, my ups and downs. <laughs> we, we all love her. We all love her. I, I want to back up a little bit, uh, Luis, because I remember, although we talked about, the, you know, life as a farm worker child and going from harvest to harvest, but there was one point when you, you had a ranch and you thought you had really hit the big time and were rich and you had a ranch until the war ended. And that ranch, tell us about that ranch. Well, it was my dad. Uh, and actually it's the basis of uh, my recent play, Valley of the Heart, you know, which right. deals with the, the love right. story between uh, 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 the daughter, the Nisi daughter of the Japanese farm, uh, farmer, you know, the Issei farmer. And, and the Mexican-Americans, the oldest son of a sharecropping family. Well, that's, that's sort of based on my experiences from my first days. I was born in 1940. And in 1941, of course, Pearl Harbor happened. So uh, my dad at that time was working for a Japanese uh, farmer, a Japanese Issei immigrant farmer in the Delano area who was doing all right for himself and his family. Uh, but he, he hired uh, my dad and he hired other Mexican workers. So when uh, Pearl Harbor happened in the spring, uh, in this December of 41, the army came in and eventually the whole family was uh, taken away and put into a concentration camp. 
And so what the army did in those instances was they looked around for the farm working crew of any particular ranch and offered them the ability, the opportunity to be able to run the ranch. And so my dad became then the operator, the farmer on, on his ex boss's um, farm. Wow. And so I came in in 1940, I came to consciousness in those first years of the world, world war II. And I thought we owned the place. I thought, no, we're landed. You know what I'm saying? It, we had sure. a, we had a car, uh, we a uh, wonderful car, you know, a Chevy, 41 Chevy. Uh, we, we had two houses. Uh, we had, uh, the only thing we didn't have were a lot of tractors because uh, we had to farm with mules. My dad had to farm with mules because of war restrictions again. But uh, we even had German prisoners of war working for us. Can you believe that? Wow. Yeah, these were people that had uh, been brought to California. And so we had braceros and we had uh, Germans, you know, working on the ranch. And my dad used to farm uh, whatever the army asked him to. He was uh, on direct military contract. And so we were, the World War II years were very prosperous years. And I misunderstood completely what was going on. I thought my dad owned it. I thought that uh, this was our land. And so I had a certain sense of pride and a certain sense of possession about the ranch. Then comes the end of the war and everything changed immediately. The price supports uh, were removed. Uh, the army stopped dealing with the farmers. And, um, and so competition came in and my dad lost the ranch. It was very simple. He, he didn't have the money to buy it. It wasn't his to begin with. It had been leased to him. And uh, the price went up after the war and uh, it, it, it changed. And so by 1946, we were back on the migrant path. And wow. it was like, it was like night and day for me. It was like being in day and suddenly being going into night and saying, what happened? I asked my older brother, what happened? We used to be rich. <laughs> and he'd laugh. He'd say, we were never rich. He said, we weren't rich. But the fact is that uh, I couldn't understand it until I, I began to uh, grow older. And, and then I, I realized it was the war and it really wasn't my dad's fault. Uh, my older brother tended to blame my dad a little bit for not holding on to the ranch, but there was no way that he could have. He, he didn't have the money, you know, but but in the eyes of the family, I mean, he, they looked up to him because he was he was a grower. You know, I mean, he had a ranch. And so that ranch still exists. As a matter of fact, um, it, it, but it's owned by a corporation now. It's owned by it was more recently by Teneco, I think, a big oil corporation. And when I went back to work with Cesar Chavez, we picketed that camp. You know, we picketed our own ranch, you know? I mean, I was out there uh, oh. picketing the house where my sister was born. And, and I remember this was our ranch and uh, it was in the hands of another grower at the time. And uh, anyway, the whole world changed. Uh, California agriculture has always been a corporate enterprise. And uh, that's what Cesar was fighting. That was what he was organizing against. These were industrial working conditions. You know, it needed an industrial union. A lot of people confuse the arm, the image of the American farmer with, with really uh, hardcore corporate farming that exists today. And these are two worlds that are very, very distinct and very different. And so, uh, my family's experience with this ranch was transitional because that ranch that had belonged to a Japanese American farmer ended up in the hands of an American corporation. And I'm sure they never got the bag ever. She ne they, they never, never got came back. They never got to recoup the, their losses. Now, my heart went out to the family. And so I had to write this story, you know, and it had to be a love story. And, and so I, I turned it into Valley of the Heart, which is now a screenplay. We're hoping to see uh, if we can get it done once the, the COVID is behind us, you know. Mm -hmm. we, 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 it's a story that needs to be told. A lot of people don't realize that uh, there was a lot of interplay by the different uh, racial and cultural minorities in California. That's been the history of the state from the very beginning sure. when there were multiple Indian tribes here, right? I mean, it was, so the idea of a Japanese Mexican romance was, uh, was common, a lot more common than people realize or Mexican Filipino, you know? even Mexican black relationships. I mean, and of course, Anglo, the Okies, you know, there were many, many Okie Mexican relationships. And uh, I had, I grew up with Okie friends, you know, that that came from Oklahoma in the thirties. And so it uh, it's a rich history of California that needs to be told by playwrights that have lived it.
Yes, and Valley of the Heart is a beautiful play. It's, I saw it. At, uh, it's it's a beautiful play. I would imagine it would transfer fantastically to the screen. I can I can see it. Yeah, well, again, the advantage of having uh, a movie, you know, you can go to different places. And uh, Lupe and I went to Heart Mountain, which is the, the, the camp in Wyoming that the family was sent to in the play. Uh, it, it's one of Manzanares, the other big one, the California yeah. families went to. But uh, Heart Mountain is, uh, is, is, uh, has this mountain and it's kind of symbol of, of the camps. There were 10,000 people there. And I was invited to give the, uh, the keynote address uh, <sighs> about three years ago at their annual convocation there at the Education Center. And uh, so it was a massive experience for us to be there. And, and it's Buffalo country, you know, I mean, up there. It's, it's next to Cody, which is named after B Buffalo Bill, you know, Wild Bill Cody. And, and um, it's amazing. It's amazing what happened and how they took 10,000 Japanese Americans and plopped them in the middle of Buffalo country. And they turned it into a, a farming area. It had never been a farming area. So you go there now and there are farms all over the place because of the Japanese uh, Americans. So, I mean, given what's happening with Asian Americans right now, yes, yes. it is amazing to me that, that this kind of discrimination, it's amazing that it exists against black people to begin with and Native Americans, but Asians and, and Mexicans to say the least, I mean, we're all part of an America that has always been here and, uh, and it needs a new consensus. People need to change what the narrative is. You know, the, the narrative that only allows uh, people from Europe and more specifically people from uh, Western Europe, Anglo Europe, you know, to, to, to be, uh, have the title of Americans. It's a long story, it goes back 30,000 years. I've, I've written about uh, the Aztec and Mayan heritage that we share. This is America, you know? It, it, the America that existed here, it's like going to Europe and ignoring the Romans and the Greeks and saying they never existed. And no one can come to America without running head on to the ancients that have been here for millennia. And we're an extension of that. We are an expression of that America. We are the original Americans. And we need our story to be told, not to the detriment of other people. I embrace all of the history. I embrace the history of Europe as mine also because of our Spanish forefathers uh, and our Arabic forefathers, you know, because uh, we, we have that connection, but also because uh, I, 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 uh, we're human, you know, and so Asia is mine in every, all of its aspects. Africa is mine in all of its aspects. And I celebrate it all. I celebrate human wisdom all over the world. Everybody has contributed to the pot, you know. But the thing that, that, that distresses me is that the real Native American contributions have not been acknowledged. And they need to be acknowledged in the popular culture. We need uh, pieces that speak to to our origins, you know. I have a book coming out, Dan, uh, in July. It's being published by Rutledge Press out of London. And it took the English to do it. Uh, an American company uh, has, has never offered. But yeah. anyway, out yeah. of, it's an academic book, but it's called uh, Theater of the Sphere, The Vibrant Being, in which I explain the aesthetic of El Teatro Campesino. And it, it delves into Mayan mathematics. It deals with uh, their whole... Uh, moral system, you know, the 20 pasos, the, the, the sacred calendar, the 20 days of the sacred calendar. This, this has been the framework that we've used to teach our students for, for the last 50 years in El Teatro Campesino. Uh, those that have come and taken the Vibrant Being workshop know what I'm talking about, but this is the first time that it has been uh, organized and, and put together in a way that other people will be able to read it now and utilize it in, in their classes or in their groups. Uh, but, but if they just want to know about history, it'll be available. It's called Theater of the Sphere of the Vibrant Being. It comes out in July in both hardback and in paperback. And this is uh, also the history of El Teatro Campesino. It's amazing that Europe uh, <clears throat> is more embracing of, of, of Mexican culture and Chicano culture. And of course, consider us Americans, which indeed we obviously are. But but you're right. You, some, uh, I, I think I mentioned it before, but I did a... Um, I produced a night of Chicano and Tex-Mex music in Paris, and I took Dad and Flaco Jimenez. And, and the great thing about it for me is that it was a weekend festival of American music. Mm. They considered Chicano and Tex-Mex as American music, which indeed it is. 
but yeah. we had to go to Europe to, to, to do it. <laughs> well, we went to, uh, Jethro was invited to the World Theater Festival in 1969. And that, that established, uh, again, the beginnings of our reputation in Europe. We did uh, seven you know, major tours in, in Western Europe uh, throughout the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, and uh, performed in all the, the European capitals and, uh, and still have a following, of course, in, in Europe. It, uh, they're very aware of, of the contribution that, uh, that Chicanos have made to American culture. Uh, not yeah. just our cuisine, but also our music, also our historical presence, right? And uh, and I mean, there's a reason why World War One, you know, the 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 involvement of the U.S. in in World War One uh, was caused by the Zimmerman telegram that was sent by the foreign minister in Germany to Mexico, uh, offering to give back Texas and Arizona and New Mexico back to Mexico if they joined the war on the side of Germany, <laughs> you know, if Mexico joined on the side of Germany. Well, that that caused Woodrow Wilson to say, that's enough, you know, we're gonna declare war on Germany and Mexico don't move. Of course, it's during the Mexican revolution because we're talking 1917 here. But uh, even so, I mean, uh, Germany uh, uh, and, and other European, France and England have always looked at, at the America from a much broader perspective. You know, America is not just the United States. America is the whole hemisphere, yes. the whole continent, yes. right? And and uh, and so they've understood it politically, they've understood it economically and culturally, and uh, and it's time that Americans living in the United States uh, got over this business about the the border and 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 as if there's a lot, this fictitious line in the desert doesn't mean anything, particularly for your family and mine that came from that region, right? I mean, uh, I I have people on my family that were coming from. Monterey from uh, Sonora as vaqueros to work in Tucson and, and to work in Arizona before there was a United States and Mexico connection there. I mean, this was, it was all part of the ancestral lands, right? The Sonoran Desert, this is Sonora. And, um, and so a, a, our memory of America is a lot longer and deeper. And this is what I appeal to young uh, Mexican American and other Latino uh, writers Latina writers that we must tell this story, you know, it, it um, I love the works that are being written, Reina Grande and, and others that, that are, are writing about our history from their personal experiences, but we need to deepen the game, you know, it, it, and broaden the screen and the look from the perspective from Europe and Asia and other parts of the world has always been broader and deeper than what the, the people that look at it from inside the United States. You know, it's our, it's our responsibility to widen that view and to make it wiser and better and more accurate. They're out there. The younger generation is, is, is I've gone to a lot of universities and speaking and stuff, and, and I meet these, these young Latinos and they are fiery. They're, they are really, you- They're you, bilingual you know, too, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they, they absolutely inspire me, you know, I, I uh, yeah. It'll be there. It'll be there. I want to back up a little bit to San Jose State because, as we said earlier, you were there with math and physics, and then you graduated. But while you were there, you were not only deep into, into the drama at clubs, etc., but you were a member of MAPA, the Mexican American Political uh, Association. Uh, you were involved in the uh, Kennedy, the Viva Kennedy campaign, and you were already, uh, 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 as, as I read somewhere, a radical student, and we have some proof here. Look at that. <laughs> That's when you're in San Jose State. So you were already prepping. You're, you're, it's amazing. I'm telling you, seeing your journey, it all makes perfect sense. I don't know if it made sense to you when it was happening, but looking back, that, that activism that 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 was was that the, the birth of all that for you outwardly or were you always very much aware it seemed you were you said earlier that uh, you very early you could see the inequities yeah you know it was a, a part of a process of self-definition and I, I grew the mustache because of my grandfather my grandfather had a mustache and i always admired him my grandfather on my mother's side you know and so i decided to grow the brocha you know in in honor of him uh, but the the um, this was after between high school and college, and I in that shot, which is taken sixty three, uh, that uh, you take a back, go back to that shot if you can. You do that, Abelardo. Can you go back? <laughs> Abelardo, he might have fallen asleep. 
<laughs> Hello. There, there we, we are. are. There we go. Uh, uh, you see the chair there. It says Seventh Street Forum, and it was a street that used to cross uh, campus, Seventh Street. And so we were discussing that there was that there was really no quad in San Jose State that we could give speeches. So uh, I grabbed the chair from the cafeteria and took it out to the middle of the street and put it down. And uh, and then the students gathered around and we began to talk and uh, uh, give speeches on the, obviously on a soapbox, a chair here. And eventually we closed the street. It became part of the campus. Uh, it's like an open area now, but uh, it, it was 1963. We were talking about Vietnam and Latin America and, and Cuba, and there was a lot to talk about, but I'd already begun to develop a, 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 a look here. And the, the, the white jeans are, are Levi's, they're white Levi's, but they reminded me of like Calzón Blanco, you know? Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. eventually I went to Huarachis. I mean, it, it became a style thing as well as a political thing. And interestingly enough, the, the Chicano movement uh, about five years later adopted these. By 68, this was like the standard look of Chicanos on campus, right? But this was not happening in 1963. It was, um, it was, you know, it, uh, revolutions happen on all levels, the way you dress, what you eat, how you look, all of that. And, and it seemed to me, I felt the intensity of our Chicano needs at every level. You know, we needed to change the way we look, the, the way we present ourselves to the public and the way that we express ourselves. It had to be bilingual for sure. Uh, we couldn't afford to lose our Spanish, but uh, we had to pick up the English and the English had to be cogent and it had to be right on, on the nose. Now, do you think that so much that you learned in drama and theater served you well as an activist because you were able to get a chair and stand up and address people? I would imagine those uh, uh, those lessons you learned in theater helped you. Uh, absolutely. And that's uh, I mean, that's something that uh, is part of the blood and bone of a Teatro Campesino is that in order to empower people, you have to teach them how to express themselves, to lose the the not is shame, but the sense of shyness, you know, of not getting up in public, that that has to go away right away. You do that through improvisation. You do that by confronting it. And of course, it, it that started with the uh, Campesinos and Delano. Cesar saw how people that joined the teatro suddenly became really articulate, you know, and, and, and really kind of comfortable in public. And so we lost a lot of our early actors uh, off to the boycott and to other places in California because Cesar would take them. And uh, eventually I had to withdraw the teatro from the United Farm Workers in order to hold on to our actors, you know? So, so we, we backed off from the union and formed our own nonprofit corporation, but we continued to work with the strike. We continued to work with Cesar and, and the United Farm Workers. We're still part of the cause, but it needed a different basis. But it, it's that principle that uh, uh, expression, public expression the, is, is really part of, uh, uh, of democracy, you know, you, if you don't have people willing to speak out and able to speak out, uh, the silence can kill you, you know, eventually. Uh, for me, in some ways, it started in Delano in the 16th of September celebrations. In those days, they'd bring out the old tribuna, you know, which was a stage on automobile tires into the middle of the street and celebrate the 16th of September in Delano. And, but they, and in those days, I'm talking about the 40s, they used to have actual veterans of the Mexican Revolution out there, you know, uh, echando discursos, as they used to say, right? Oraciones, they get out there and, 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 and speak in, in this centurion kind of Mexican style, men and women. But uh, they used to sit up there and they were veterans that rode with Pancho Villa and with Zapata. That never left, left me. And uh, there's a, a photo, I know I don't have it on here, but there's a photo of the first time that, that uh, I, I went to Delano to talk to Cesar and I'm in the audience. And I'm listening to Cesar. So you have the shot over the shoulder of Cesar talking and me listening to him. And, and I, what I'm thinking, I remember what I was thinking. I was thinking, this guy's really natural. You know, he's really laid back. Um, it, 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 he's got a very interesting style. He can really communicate. Anyway, I see it all in a photograph because I remember what I was thinking. And uh, I, I knew, I sensed at the time that he was a natural born leader. You know, he could communicate with people. And uh, it, there was something phony about him. It was very honest and very direct, but he was, he was able to speak. And that's what gave Cesar his strength. He was able to express what people were feeling and thinking and what they needed to know. And so he was very honest about that. 
And uh, and so I was on that track already. You know, it, it, I was a little more dramatic because I was a playwright and an actor. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, because the thing about Caesar, he was so calm. He was not yeah. a fiery speaker or, a you know, get people all excited. He would be very calm and very he had that that aura about him. You know, he was. He was he he was quite unique, I, you know, because you as magnificent as you are, you're you're still very accessible. Dolores Huerta también. She's she's like your tia, but <laughs> Caesar. Not that he was he could have been warmer and kinder and open, but there was something about him that he's like he was on another plane or something. I was talking about this before, but you know, Cesar used to be a pachuco, you know. Let's talk about Yes, Cesar I know. I know. Back in the 40s. So there was an element of him. He, he was a jazz aficionado. I mean, there was there was a laid back, very cool, very sharp, intelligent personality there, you know, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. underneath that humble exterior, you know, that the world got to know. Uh, there was a quick mind there that that uh could think, you know. Uh, a lot faster than a lot of people uh, give him credit for. I mean, he I'm was, sure that's true. I'm he, sure he was, that's he true. Was very, very quick, and and nothing escaped him. He was very observant. Actually, he had a thing he used to do, which was very telling of his personality. We could be sitting in a meeting, and there would be a fly floating <laughs> around, really, and and he wouldn't say anything. I, I was amazed me the first time I saw this, and he would come up behind the fly, you know, with his hand. And catch it. <laughs> he could snack. He could snatch a fly out of the air. And and I saw him do this more than once. And I'm saying, Cesar, how do you do that? Yeah. And he said, you just gotta, you, you just gotta be quiet. He said, you, I mean, it was amazing. And uh, and he caught more than one fly. Believe me, <laughs> <laughs> he caught quite a few flies, as it turns exactly. out. What you know, the first time I met him, I was so in awe and, and I called him Mr. Chavez. Oh. And he said, Oh, call me Caesar. Yeah, everyone did, of course. And I was like, oh, I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't. And I swear, every time I would see him after that first meeting, because I would do things with him and blah blah. And he would always go, Hey, hi, Dan. And I'd go, Hey. I never called him anything because I couldn't <laughs> call him Caesar. He said not, call, not to call him, you know, Mr. Chavez. So I would just say, hey, I don't know that he, if he ever noticed, but it's kind of embarrassing looking back now. Um, it seems so many of the things led to the, the farm workers and the teatro and all, because that was the big that was the big coming out, though you were very present always. But it seemed even when you left San Jose State with your math and physics, you joined the San Francisco Mine Company, Mine Company. And Mine a lot of the yeah. yeah, and a lot of the techniques that you learned there in theater, you used in the actos, the the that you would do in the fields with the teatro. Tell us about that. Well, the the, the mine troop uh, at that time led by uh, Ronnie Davis, you know, were into bringing uh, an adaptation of the of the Commedia form, Commedia dell'arte, which is really born on the streets of, of Italy, right? I mean, right. They, in, in the various cities and communities, very popular. Uh, they had a tremendous influence on Shakespeare. A lot of people don't know that, but a lot of Shakespeare's plots and characters came from from exposure, you know, to, to Italian uh, Commedia dell'arte. But the thing is that uh, it's people, it's workers' theater, it's people's theater, it's popular theater. Correct. And, and so Ron Davis was pushing this for political reasons. He wanted to see this form uh, in, in, in the American culture. So San Francisco was the place for it to be. We performed uh, when I joined the mime troupe after I graduated from San Jose State, I went up with my plays, you know, hoping to get produced in San Francisco, which was a Mecca in California at the time, you know, a theater with the actors workshop and, uh, and other things happening in San Francisco. They had a real theater district, you know, downtown. But the thing is that uh, the mime troupe attracted me because uh, I was fascinated by their performances outdoors and the fact that they were using masks and they were using comedia. Uh, so I, I lapped it up, you know, I became a sponge. I went there to learn and, uh, and, and ended up spending a year with the mime troupe. Uh, also the workshop, they had wonderful workshops having to do with movement, uh, with mime itself. A lot of people confuse mime with pantomime. They're two separate things, you know. Mime is 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 using your body in a number of different ways, uh, but uh, 
the fact is that uh, it, it was part of a cultural change that was happening in San Francisco at the time. This is 1964. So I, I moved to uh, the Haight-Ashbury district before it was uh, psychedelic. It was just a low rent district. A lot of artists uh, were coming in and renting apartments there because it was working class. And yet it was very, very, very uh, uh, rich in terms of uh, the, the cultural overlays, you know, West Indian and Russian and Jewish, every, uh, the whole thing. Anyway, um, we began, I began then to train and perform with the mime troupe uh, and, and picked up as much as I could, particularly the idea of adapting classical works, you know, into, into a modern context. But what interested me most was the idea of the types that existed in Comedia. So you had uh, Arlequino, uh, for instance, is a character, Harlequin, Arlequino. Cantinflas is an Arlequino, for mm -hmm. instance, as types go. And then you had uh, Dottores, and, and uh, you had uh, uh, soldiers, you know, the, uh, the General Furioso. Uh, you, you, you had uh, Brigellas, who's kind of like a criminal. Uh, anyway, I ended up then playing a Brigella type in one of the comedias that we did. And, uh, and studying the other types of characters that, that uh, were developed. So when I went to Delano, I figured that I had to adapt that to my uses. And so instead of uh, pantalones, I had patroncitos. Instead of brigelas, you know, I had the contratista. Instead of uh, arlequinos, I had the huelguista. And the esquirol became like a fool, right? So uh, these were four types, male and female that we worked with and I was able to communicate this to the campesinos. They adapted to it like ducks to water. They took to it right away. One of our founding members, Felipe Cantu, for instance, who played the snake man in La Bamba. He's the guy with the rattlesnakes, you oh, know, the, yeah. the yeah. brujo. Well, that's Felipe Cantu. He was, he was a, a resident genius at the Teatro Campesino, uh, straight out of the fields, you know, a straight campesino. And, and yet he is, is, his talent was was tremendous. He could improvise. He was funny as hell. And we used to call him Cantuflas, you know, because uh, Cantinflas was his hero. Uh, but in any case, um, he, he ended up being uh, an Arlequino type. He ended up being a type, you know, the huelguista, Don Sotaco. So my experiences with the mime crew gave me a framework within which to work. I later realized as we began to improvise that there was more to it. So. We developed actos, which were the, the skits, you know, that had to do with social activism. Mm -hmm. and, and later on, we developed another form that we call mythos that had to do with myth. That was a bit later. And then uh, we developed corridos almost from the very beginning, first as songs and then as, uh, as scores for musical actos that we were presenting. So actos, mythos, corridos finally combined to create the long form that I created called historias that have to do with our history. Zoot Suit was my first historia. And so the elements of the acto, of the mito and the corrido uh, ended up playing, coming together in Zoot Suit, specifically to the music of your dad. You know, Lalo uh, did the world uh, brilliant service, not just capturing the patois, you know, the pachuco, but the grandness, the beauty, the dignity of the style because Lalo was a, was a master musician, so he had his own orchestra, you know, he was an orchestra leader. He had also been one of my heroes. I don't know if you know this, but uh, I remember I was a barefoot little kid, man, in the barrios when Lalo Guerrero would come to town. Oh. Man, he was our hero, and I would, I would chase his car, you know, and later when I was in college, he would come to San Jose to the Rainbow Ballroom, and yes. uh, yeah, I yeah. always appreciated that I could get in and dance for free, you know. Me, me and my sisters, we all loved the fact that uh, mm -hmm. that we could always go uh, and, and dance at Lalo's uh, dates, you know, at the Rainbow Ballroom, which, of course, was one of the old traditional dance halls in Delano uh, uh, in the old days. But uh, so Lalo's music fused with the other elements to create Zoot Suit and became an historia. So, yeah, the, the experience with the Mind Proof was foundational for me. It was an eye opener as far as uh, bringing people out into the park, uh, bringing plays out into the parks outdoors, because obviously in Delano, we had to perform outdoors when we went to the picket line. That was where it began. Sure, of course. We, we have told me there's no money to do theater. There's no stage. There's no time to rehearse and no actors. 
He said, all we have is the picket line. So I said, that's it. The teatro has to be born on the picket line. And it was, you know, out, out in the open. And then eventually when with the, we did the strike meetings, there were just barely enough room to act. But the fact is that uh, all these foundational experiences gave me the, the tools with which to create uh, El Teatro Campesino through the workers themselves. Uh, I, I, I just gave them free reign. I, I used to give a structure. I had an outline, like a shot list almost. I had an outline of the acto, uh, but uh, I, I couldn't write. I made the mistake of writing a script once and handing it out, and they just threw the workers overboard. They couldn't read, <laughs> you know? They got stuck <laughs> on the paper, and, and we couldn't get in. We couldn't make any progress. So I ripped up all of the scripts. I said, give me those. And I collected them and I ripped up the script. And I said, we're just going to make it up. We're going to improvise. And so uh, all of the actors were improvised, you know. And you, I, I'm going to back. We have a couple of photos when you first, I don't know, when you first were with the, uh, this that, that, early on, because it's not even the United Farm Workers. It's, it's the. Uh, that's, that's the farm workers. That's the NFWA, the National Farm Workers Association. Right. Before right. uh, the National Farm Workers Association and AWOC, which was the AFL CIO, right? Uh, you, you uh, fuse, you know. That's me as a picket captain up on top of the Pereira, the old dog catcher, that became our first stage. Oh my God! You know. Oh, you but, were well, because you. We have another photo of you with Caesar, I believe. Yeah, that's on the picket line. Yeah, right. And there you are. But let me yeah. ask you this: how how long were you already working with Caesar and the farm work and the union before the idea of the teatro came about, or or was it at the same time? What what, what was that? What what made you think? You know, what we need is the theater company. What made you think that? <laughs> well, the thing is that I pitched him the idea to begin with, right? I mean, this is my first meeting with says that was. But you actually, as I recall, you pitched it to Dolores, who liked it and said to take it to Caesar, no? I pitched it to Dolores first. Yeah, I, I yeah. met her first. Right. And she said she said she liked it because she's always enthusiastic about anything, you know. But she, <laughs> but she was so positive that I said, wow, OK, maybe I have a chance. <laughs> That's I was a little more serious. But uh, I was I was shuttling between Delano and San Francisco. I was still committed to the mime troupe in San Francisco. So I had to wait until Cesar came to the Bay Area. Uh, a couple of weeks after I was in Delano and I didn't get a chance to talk to him. And I was still performing on weekends, so I had to come back to the city. But anyway, since I did come and he came to the Mission District and it was so, uh, it was so, he was being mobbed. I couldn't get, I couldn't even approach him. And so I, I eventually ended up hit, uh, hitching a ride with someone in his entourage over the, the Bay Bridge to Oakland. And at the end of a very long day, because he's had speeches at Oakland as well, uh, and the basement apartment of St. Elizabeth Church there, they had a cursillo meeting. I don't know if you know what a cursillo meeting is for married couples, right? Oh. Uh -huh. and, and so uh, he was going to speak to this group. And so I, I went in there and, and they were singing this lovely song that I'd never heard before, but it, it, it kind of like registered. And so then I, at the end of that day, I spoke to Cesar and pitched, I told him, this is what I want to do. He said, Dolores spoke to me about it. Uh, but then he said, there's no money to do theater in Delano. There are no actors, you know, you still want to do it. And I said, absolutely, he says, I want an opportunity. So I volunteered, you know, <laughs> he gave me a ride back to uh, the Haight Ashbury where I was living. Uh, but we struck it off. I said, I'm, I like, I like these people. I, 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 I think this is where I belong. I found my home, you know. So yeah. I went back to Delano, and and I, I realized that I, I couldn't move right away. I had to get a lay of the land. So I had to get used to the time frame. You know, I had to be up at three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. I wasn't used to those hours. <laughs> but uh, by that time, uh, I, I got used to it, and I, I participated in in on of the picket line. And uh, I teamed up with Augie Lida, who played a guitar, and we started singing songs on the picket line and then at, at meetings. And then about a month in, uh, I was uh, elected picket captain, the next picket captain. So then I had control of the picket line, and I started introducing uh, the chants, you know, that I had learned in the anti-war movement, because we were anti-Vietnam War. And uh, I, uh, from, you know, the chants from the picket lines in San Francisco. And all of that went into the picket line and I kept this, the spirit going. And then we began to improvise up on the, the Pereira on top of the flatbed truck. And then that led to our performances in the meetings. I did post uh, an announcement that a Teatro Campesino was being put together. 
and I put it uh, up in the union office uh, on November 2nd, uh, 1965, which was Day of the Dead. And uh, so that is our official founding date, November 2nd, right? <laughs> but we really didn't get going until uh, the end of November, you know, early December. And uh, it, it uh, this grape started to change. And then what really pulled us together was the following spring, the March of Sacramento, when uh, uh, the, the union asked us to organize all the nightly rallies, 25 nights in a row. They gave us a flatbed truck. We had the big union banner. Wow. And uh, and so the I had a, a group together then, Felipe Cantu, I mentioned, Augie. There were a few others that that became part of the teatro. And so we became our, our first our first group, our first company on the March of Sacramento, uh, performing about six, seven actors that we had put together. And so we became then uh, an entity. Uh, people began to acknowledge there's a Teatro Campesino. We had our first mention in Newsweek magazine. You know, they called us uh, Instant Brecht, <laughs> the, union, oh. the union's Instant Brecht group. <laughs> Just to add water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so it was an evolution, but... Uh, it was wonderful. It, it really worked. And, and it's uh, still working. We, we have a photo from the, I don't know how early this is, but there's, there's our beautiful, beautiful Diane Rodriguez there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, let me mention, because we used to sing these songs, and one of the songs that, uh, that they asked me, uh, uh, once we began, Augie and I began to sing uh, in the meeting, Cesar asked me, he says, he says, do you remember that song they were singing in Oakland the night we met? And I said, uh, yeah, it was a lovely song. He says, if I can, if I get you the words, can you sing it at the next meeting? Can you? So and this was early on. And I said, uh, sure. So we began to sing. The name of the song was De Colores. Yeah. yeah. So that became the anthem of, of the farm workers movement. Sure. And, uh, and, and so we introduced it, you know, with the teatro. And uh, no nos moverán, nosotros venceremos, pues huelga en general. The picket, uh, picket sign. I mean, uh, Solidaridad para Siempre. All of the standard uh, movement songs, so in the farm workers movement, you know, were created uh, at that time. You know, with uh, there have been other songs since then, including your dad's Corrido de Deleno. You know, which we were so uh, so happy and proud to get. Man, it was amazing to hear being played on the radio. You know, as we were marching, as we were marching to Sacramento, there was Lalo singing. El Corrio de Deleno, you know, on the yeah. radio. It was fantastic. Yeah. It was absolutely fantastic. It validated. It, it made you, re, uh, you know, the real thing, right? To be on the radio waves in those days. Exactly. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was oh amazing. I remember we were very, uh, we were very happy to hear the news that our march had made it to the NBC national news that night. You know, when we, uh, when we left Deleno, we were on the national news and, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was all flying by the seat of our pants. You know, <laughs> we, we, we didn't know whether we were going to survive, you know, from winter to winter. It was, uh, it was a real struggle. But uh, opposed to that was this deep belief that what we were doing was absolutely right, right? So it was, it was motivated by a, a, a great feeling of causa. And, and of course, we had some great leaders. I mean, Cesar was tremendous and and, and Dolores, you know, was incredible. So uh, that, that you see Dolores' energy today. You can imagine the what same. she's like. The you, you same. You can't keep up with that you know? woman. No, you yeah. can't keep up with her. It's, it's yeah. amazing. It's yeah. amazing. Let, let's bring Lupe back on okay, because she Lupe was back. through it all. You know, I said at the beginning, Luis, that we'd have to do three happy hours. We barely <laughs> scratched the surface. I want to talk about about the films and the zoot suit and the play and maybe we maybe you come back in a few uh, in a few happy hours. Would you come back and we do the next chapter? We could do that. Yeah. 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 This, now we laid the laid the, the the groundwork there and through through almost all of it, the great Lupe, right? Hanging on, pushing, <laughs> supporting, <laughs> mostly hanging on, right? <laughs> How did you feel during all this when he'd say, let's jump off this cliff? Were you like, well, now let's think about this. Or were you like, here, let me get my shawl. How, how were you with all this ride? Well, you know, I was only 24 years old. When you're 24, <laughs> you you think though, you know, anything is possible. So, you know, there's no, 
you just dive in, you just get in into it. So uh, there was no like, what if, what my could happen, nothing like that, no. Uh, but you also never, but you also never said, Luis, you know, Mijo, you should get a job. We've got kids now, and you never did that. No, never, never. Uh, no. I've always been a very practical. I'm very much like my mother. You know, we're we're. Uh, I she never wanted to be in debt, and so one of the things that from the very beginning, Luis, I I told Luis, I I don't want to have to worry about money, so. We have, we still live in the same house we lived 30 years ago where, you know, the it's, we live very comfortable, uh, but you know, it's a, the very practical sense of our life. So from the very beginning, uh, you know, as long as we paid our bills and had a roof over our head, I was happy. Yeah. My so, mother used to say, as long as we have a pot of beans and some tortillas, we're fine. And dad has the guitar and, and, and she also, she never said, Hey, you got kids, you got, and that's a musician. That's, that's worse than a playwright. But, <laughs> but, but she, she knew that he had to have his music. She right. knew he had to have his music. Like you knew he had his, 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 his journey, his mission, you know? So well, I believed everything that we were doing. I mean, it, well, it, like yes. you said, it is a partnership. It, if yes. I didn't believe in the politics of what's important in our lives, it would not have been, uh, I would not have uh, encouraged it. That's uh, true. You know, I mean, you have to believe in it. You're right. Yeah, you know, we have the same politics, you know. I, yeah, I also, I mean, we, we believe in cariño, you know, that, again, sense of humor is really important for oh, life. Yes, you know? yes. Cariño, you know, you got to, you, and people do it with their pets automatically because pets draw the cariño out of you, you know, a dog or a cat, you know. <laughs> but you, it, it's good to have it with people, you know what I mean, with your kids, with your... <laughs> if you can work it, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, because, that's... I mean, it's it, it's very special. I, I Most cultures uh, I don't necessarily define love that way, but cariño is... Cariño is universal. You know, you can have cariño uh, for men, women, children, dogs, doesn't matter, everything, right? But it's so important for your well-being to feel this cariño, right? And and so the, a marriage is based on cariño. You know, I you love and respect, but you also feel very affectionate toward your partner. And uh, uh, thanks to Lupe, I mean, we've been able to maintain our cariño for all these years. You know, it's a foundation. It's really important. I have a quote I'm going to read about because we're finishing with the theater part. And really, I'm serious. And, and, and after you catch your breath in a couple of months, come back and we're going to do the full, the Hollywood years and, and what's going on now. And, and, and that would be great. But I, when the book comes out, you know, when the yes. book comes out, let's do it then. Perfect. Perfect. You let me know yeah. and, and, and we're in. But All I right. love what you said about political theater. You said. My approach to political theater is that the way to the mind is through the heart. Mm -hmm. If you can touch the heart, then people will come to the ideas themselves. That's true. I believe that's true. You still believe it's true, right? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's the key to the arts, really, when you think about it, whether it's music or, or film or theater or literature. You gotta touch people. You gotta, you gotta touch, touch the heart, people. you know? And, uh, I've gotten on a on a jag recently. Uh, back into Dickens, you know. I'm kind of going around full circle, Charles Dickens. <laughs> and and what I'm beginning <laughs> at this older age now, I'm beginning to realize. I mean, he had quite a social conscience, this guy, right? And and Charles Dickens, because of his background, but he touched the heart in so many different ways about poverty and people struggling in life. That that's what lends greatness to his work, right? And and um, and so it it that element, what you're just saying, is 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 absolutely crucial in terms of the narrative, you know, that we all tell ourselves. We all tell ourselves a narrative of what life is and what our history is. And that narrative is askew right now. It hasn't really given everybody their full credit. And uh, give the credit where credit is due. But Black people need their due. Asians need their due. Native Americans need their due. You know what I mean? Just like the Anglos need, everybody needs their due. The narrative has to be broader and deeper and more universal to accommodate all of us in America. That's touching the heart. Touch the heart of everybody, you know? Yes. So. Yes. Okay. Do we have a couple of questions there? Uh, is that your hair, Abelardo? What's going on? <laughs> What's, what is that? Know. Abelardo's gotten much more dramatic looking. So yeah, the wow. Pictures. You got a little Bella Lugosi going on there. What's happening? Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Always with the compliment. <laughs> okay. if you want it's getting to, dark go for it go it's a little bit it. darker here anyway 
Here, let me lighten this up. Uh, anyway, thank you very much, Luis. Thank you very much, Lupe, Dan. As always, the great questions and the, the, the really nice way to bring out these beautiful stories. We have a few questions. Yolanda Nava. Um, oh, we she, love she, Yolanda Nava. We Yolanda love Yolanda wrote this one in. She, uh, she said, Luis, an obvious genius, his immense spirit permeates all he does. What creative programs are available to those who desire to become playwrights? And who are the playwrights to watch? Oh, wow. Well. That's well, 27 I'm... questions in one. <laughs> there are a lot of new playwrights, you know, many of them are appearing over at the Latino Theater Company, you know, in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, certainly Josefina Lopez, Octavio Solis, uh, Jose Cruz Gonzalez. You know, there's a few other names that are a little younger. Uh, Luis Alfaro. Luis, Alf Luis Alfaro, <laughs> to be sure. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, uh, I'm overjoyed that there are these new voices and that they're they're so they're, they're so dramatic, you know, as the case may be in the theater, but they're so intelligent, they're so uh, insightful, you know, to the human condition. So it it just gives me a great deal of pride and joy that uh, that they're coming along. I think in terms of that respect, Chicano literature and Latino literature in general, you know, is gaining uh, ground. And uh, so I would recommend uh, for people to look out to see what's being published, you know, and and to read and to support the the new people in the theater. We need the audiences to do the theater. Yeah. Yes, we do, and, the, and soon, and audiences are coming back soon, hopefully, to the theaters as they open, as the as the muse the museums open as well. Uh, from uh, John Echevestic, uh, can you share the story about being in a theater in LA in your youth? My story in, in theater in the youth. Uh, in LA. In Los where, Angeles. Where, well, were you in a Were you in a theater in LA in your youth? That's what John is asking. No, I was, uh, well, I was in the theater, uh, my youth, it depends on how you define my youth. The, the Teatro came to Delano, uh, to uh, LA uh, early on in the strike. It was still 66, I think, when we first performed at the uh, Unitarian Church there in Los Angeles uh, with the Teatro. But that was my first direct experience directly with Los Angeles. Uh, I do have cousins and family in Los Angeles, starting with... Uh, with Lalo and with Dan, you know, the Guerrero branch. But uh, there were others in the Valdez side that were actually extras and worked in the movie business. Uh, but uh, they, they weren't in the theater. They were more interested in, in, in the television and movie industry and, and tried to work uh, uh, in that score. Uh, I don't have childhood memories of doing theater in Los Angeles, although I do have childhood memories of LA during World War II. Uh, 1943 comes to mind, believe it or not. I remember uh, pulling a little wooden army truck uh, uh, there by La Placita. Uh, there was a garden and it was World War II uh, and it was the Zoot Suit Riots. My, my mm -hmm. parents explained that they left the city because of the Zoot Suit Riots and went back up north. Wow. Well, we have a, another question here. Uh, tell us about Helen Mirren's time with Teatro. Oh, yeah, uh -oh. yeah. Well, you're talking about 1973. In 1973, Peter Brook and his International Center for Theater Research came with about 25 actors and designers to spend two months in San Juan Bautista. Of the three months they spent in the States at that time, two were in San Juan. And we had uh, a, a workshop that lasted all summer. We worked with them uh, in a piece called Conference of the Birds, which was a Sufi piece. piece and uh, an Arabic author, uh, a Persian, a Persian author. And uh, they did actos with us. We actually went uh, to the Valley and, and performed for the United Farm Workers the summer of 43, when there was uh, violence and, and, and renewed activity in the strike. Uh, 73. Be, in 73, what did I say? 43. Oh, no, 73. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting my date and decades with up. 73. Uh, it, because of the renewal of the contract. So they got to experience the strike directly. And Helen Mirren was 25, 26 years old at the time. Uh, she had already begun to be a movie star in LA, but she decided to take some time off to work with uh, Peter Brook. And so she joined them, uh, the company here and was here the full two months. Um, 
she was totally participant. I mean, she made no bones about being a movie star. She wasn't yet a movie star or even a, a starlet or anything like that. But she was uh, quite beautiful and quite blonde and, uh, and quite talented, I must say. And uh, the one thing that kind of stood out is that she bought herself a red convertible <laughs> that uh, she and other members of the, of the company used to go to the beach, to go to Santa Cruz on weekends. Uh, and 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 uh, I remember wearing she wearing these floppy hats that she would wear as the as the convertible went through the air. Uh, she did meet Taylor Hackford uh, here. Taylor Hackford at that time was uh, was um, my brother Daniel's agent, uh, musical agent, and uh, he came to talk to my brother, and he met Helen at the time. And uh, they hit it off. And so they began, they, they initiated a love affair that led to their marriage. They've been married for ever since then, practically. He was already married by divorce and they got remarried. Helen remained a friend. She's always been a friend all these years. Um, she was a particularly close friend with Diane Rodriguez. Yes. Of course, yes. was a, a member, you know, and Diane, of course, lived in LA and she saw her, she saw Helen more frequently. Um, so uh, the one thing that, that Helen did, which kind of stands out, is that she she tattooed herself at the end of the session. Yes. Uh, she tattooed something on her arm, which was a Naui Olin. This is the Naui Olin symbol right there. Wow. That's well, is it on her wrist? I remember seeing a yes, tattoo. No, on... she, she put it right here on her hand. Oh, yes. Yes. You know, so it was like this. And it was a tattoo. Yeah. But she still has. Yes, she does. I was shocked. Helen Mirren, the grand lady, she's tatted. I was shocked. Yeah, and she was on uh, on uh, on the Oprah Winfrey show, actually, and, and Oprah mentioned it. She said, what's that tattoo? Oh. And and uh, Helen said, well, it's a Native American symbol, you know, but it's it's Cuatro Movimiento, you know, which she learned about uh, in our workshops uh, here in, in San Juan Bautista. So it was a memorable uh, undertaking. Uh, we exchanged uh, a lot of thoughts and feelings. Uh, Peter and his company brought a Persian carpet, which was the basis of all of our improvisations. They rolled out this beautiful Persian carpet and, and we ended up participating in this uh, Sufi myth uh, about birds and, and cosmic journeys. And they ended up uh, coming to us into the fields and, and dealing with farm worker issues. Uh, we, I described them as birds with no feet. And I described ourselves as these birds with big feet and very small wings. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna read, a, it's more a statement from Angelita Rovero, who's a friend of mine. Uh, she um, we, she is, uh, teaches Chicano studies at Pierce College and also at East LA College. And of course, they, they study everything about you, 300 plus students, and they learn about you all the time. And a lot of them are watching tonight. She was very, very excited. So um, Angelita Rovero sends you, as she says, she's absolutely honored and humbled to share all these stories and your stories with, uh, with her classes, as I'm sure they do all over the country and all over the world. Well, thank you. Thank you. It, uh, the stories are meant to be shared. They, they're not stories unless they're shared. So right, that's right. That's do what we it's have, all about. Do you have one last thing? Uh, well, um, well, yeah. People are asking about your book when it's going to be available, and how could how will they be able to get copies, and especially how they could get them autographed. Well, it will be uh, offered online. I'm sure. You know, Rutledge is is, is going to be do a push. We are going to have uh, uh, a couple of events where we introduce the book to the public, right? And uh, uh, at a certain couple of universities. And so uh, I anticipate there'll be one of the universities in LA, you know, that will have an, an occasion. I, I do want uh, university students to become aware of it, but the uh, even high school students, I think will be able to get a lot out of the book because it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward and yet very fundamental in terms of uh, life lessons. This is called Theater of the Sphere, the Vibrant Being, and the theater, the sphere is life itself. I mean, it isn't just uh, the actos that we do. Uh, we're all performers, you know? 
if you could define human beings, you'd have to say that we're performers. And beyond that, we're storytellers. This is what defines us as humanity. We tell ourselves stories. And so uh, the book is really about how we tell our stories and why we tell ourselves stories. It's, uh, it's the essence of, of dramatic art, but of literature in general and, and of civilization eventually. You know, we, we started telling stories way back when we all we used to sit around the campfire, you know. Uh, I know we used to do that as farm workers, <laughs> you know. I mean, it was, uh, I remember once Loop and I took our, our, our boys up to Sequoia, you know, and just to camp out. And uh, they were surprised that I could build a fire, you know, and they said, what did you learn this? And I said, in the labor camps, because <laughs> I mean, it was, and, uh, and also that we had so many stories to tell, because up until then, I mean, all they'd known is we had television, we had movies, but they never really sat around and heard stories told, you know, and, and I think that's one of the virtues of growing up poor and farm worker, you know, long ago, is that we had the benefit of the stories from our elders. I remember sitting around just listening to our old people tell stories. That was that was that was a wealth, you know, of, of culture and inheritance. And uh, I've tried to do that with my kids. Uh, and, and certainly that's what the dramatic art is all about, to tell these stories. And that is so important, Luis. And I, I find too many young people just, oh, it's just my grandmother, grandfather, they're old people and they really don't take advantage. And I'm afraid to say I was one of them. And, <laughs> and it, uh, well, I only saw my nana and tata, my dad's, you know, once a year in Tucson for a few minutes. And, and one time he started to talk about you know, when they got first came from uh, Mexico and, and, and I was riveted and I thought, well, why haven't I been listening to this man for years? But I, it just it just never occurred. And, and I regret that. Christina Frias, who we all know and love, says that uh, Diane Rodriguez's father helped her get that red convertible. Helen Mira. I don't know what that means, but that's what she says. And she's she's at East LA College now. She wants to host some sort of vibrant bean event for the two of you. So I'll talk to her and see if there's any cash involved. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anything else? Um, no, I think I mean, we're ready to wrap it up, but we thank you so much. And uh, when your book is published, you know you have a home at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. Well, let's, and, do uh, we, there, let's do an event there, Everardo. Let's do an event there. Yes, we will. We That'd will. Be a natural. That would be a oh, natural. Yes. Oh, you yeah, come, so. you come, you come back and do the happy hour, and then we do an event there <laughs> for the book. All right, all right. We'll, we'll let Thank you in you La Plaza. Both. Primo, well, they, prima. They, I love you both. Thank you so much for this. I toast they, you both. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Lupe. Thank you, especially Dan. As always, a great host uh, for the happy hour. Uh, you could get, if you came in late to this happy hour with uh, Dan and, and Luis Valdez and Lupe, uh, you could catch it on our YouTube page. We have been recording it. We'll be posting it at La Plaza LA, YouTube at La Plaza LA. Also on our Facebook page, stays live uh, on our archive. And then also on our website, lapca.org. You could catch all of Dan's happy hours as well with uh, some people you may know, uh, Eddie James Olmos, for instance. He was, uh, he was a, a guest a while back. <laughs> and so uh, coming up, and all of this week, we had uh, Oscar Castillo last Friday showing his photographs of Cesar Chavez. Of course, we celebrated his birth uh, yesterday on the 31st. Uh, and then yesterday we had, uh, excuse me, a couple of days ago, Paul Chavez, uh, uh, his son, and the president of the Cesar Chavez Foundation was our guest on La Plaza, on En Casa con La Plaza, a couple of days ago. And you could catch that session as well on our YouTube, our, on our Facebook, and on our website. And coming up next week, just a real brief commercial. We have a, a full slate of programs, including our cooking demonstration on Monday. We have, um, well, check it out on our website, lapca.org. It's all there. <laughs> We're all here. Muchas gracias a todos our sponsors, PepsiCo, uh, Kaiser Permanente, and uh, muchas gracias a todos. We'll see you soon. Dan, maestro. Bye-bye. Gracias, Luis, Lupe. Bye-bye, mijo. Bye-bye a todos. Hasta luego. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.